So, as a general guideline, I had now have something to say to you. As a general guideline, always do everything that is unacceptable to society. Never do anything that is acceptable to society. Isn't that a nice, good general guideline? Don't don't do dumb things. You know. Be a little bit wise, be selective from a higher selectivity, and take that as a general guideline. Society says you should eat with a fork instead of your fingers. It'd be a pretty good idea to go along with society on that one day, otherwise you'll have sticky fingers for one thing. We're talking about the compulsions out there that want to drag us along with them. You don't have to obey the compulsions of society, and you won't when they're not in you. They won't have any connection with you at all. Just look out at the world all the time and recall the general guideline you were just given and see where you can apply it. You have to do the work. You have to get down to the very fine details. It's your life and it's your conditioning that has to be unraveled and finally dissolved. Look out at society and see how it and they behave. Look at your relatives. Look at your friends. See what they want. And you know they're sick. Do you? Or do, do you even know that? Yes. Don't want the, what they want. See what a marvelous teacher that, that uh, neurotic aunt is for you. See what a marvelous teacher that politician on television is for you. Don't do that. And then start to do the things they don't want to do. That's a little harder. That's a little harder because you're getting a little closer to home now where you have to start to please your real nature, who you really are, rather than the people out there who are not going to be pleased anyway. The more you please them, the more they demand. Right? Right. Yeah? Who are you trying to buy? You don't even know you're trying to buy the friendship of that woman, of that man, of that organization. I want you to tell me something. Listen to this. I want you to tell me right now, right here in class, open discussion. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me how I can get through to you that you're a mental blabbermouth, if not a verbal blabbermouth, and how I can wake you up to that fact without you breaking down in tears or hatred. Please tell me, and I'll do it. Yes, Larry. Should we, should we get Fred running? Oh, is he out there? I think he is. No, there's nobody out there. Go see, go see if there's any. There's nobody out there. All right. Uh, yes, Linda. I know I am, and I want to find out how to stop it. That's what makes me so crazy. All right, I want you to tell the rest of us what you have already learned about stopping it. All right. All right. Good start. Good start. And by the way, uh, one minute, Joan. Visitors who can't come tomorrow will have an opportunity to stand up in front and give you a little talk that we do on Sunday. Those who can't come back tomorrow, who want to, if you want to, Rubens, for example, or anyone who wants to. Those of you, not not now. When we come back from the break. Go ahead, Joan. I can speak to myself, and I think it's true of most of us. If you speak to us nicely, if you speak to us calmly, levelly, intellectually, shall we say, nothing gets through. It's when true. you speak emotionally and sharply, 
at least for a short time, we are brought up to a realization of what's going on. So I don't know how you can do it without speaking sternly. There is no way, because you're going to have to get jolted. You're, something is going to have to force every one of us to see that right in the middle of talking to someone else in this class about spiritual matters, you're sound asleep. Go ahead, Jim. Is there a concern, you don't know what that's the word, a concern on your part of what would happen if you became, quote, more direct? Oh, no concern, no. It's simply the idea of not giving people more than they can take. You, you don't teach a, a kindergarten child uh, sixth grade mathematics. The only, no, con no concern. I'm not concerned about any of you anyway, in any way at all. I am not here. Oh, all right. Come in, Fred. Just a minute, please. <clears throat> I am not here to get or keep a self-image of being your teacher in the sense that I am smarter than you. You see? So I don't have to do anything to, to keep it going. As a matter of fact, I've made an extra effort in the last, oh, three months or something like that to try to be just as disappointing a teacher as I can to you. I've made an effort to be a dull, uninspiring teacher. Are you following that? Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid, you, I'm afraid you failed. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the other one. <laughs> the difficulty in coming up with something that you have asked us to do just now for the money, to, 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 because we just don't know where, you know what to say in that respect. Because we're, we're trying to protect ourselves also, and, and we're, there's a fear of if I say something, then it's going to come. <laughs> if you say anything, you've lost it. I, I, I see some dull stares out there. What's going on? If, you, if I say, sit here and be planless for the rest of the meeting, have no anticipations, that doesn't mean you're dumb. It means you're very alert. It means the opposite. You're very alert, but you're not trying to force anything because you're not caught in compulsive forces. So, but if you react, oh, how do I sit here and have a planless meeting myself? You're already thinking that the answer is on the intellectual level, and so you're searching around to find it. And so you'll go into a wrong move. For example, you'll go into a daydream about spotted Dalmatians, and, and, not, and, and then when you shift to another daydream, in the sh uh, little spot between, you'll say, Hey, I'm doing the lesson. I'm not thinking about the class at all. No, you're thinking about Dalmatians. See, what is always so amazing uh, is that when I look at your life and I think, well, how was he able to get the shocks? Or whether something traumatic has happened in your life, you know, that you were able to take more than what we are, I, you know, it, it's unexplainable. I've explained that before, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it again briefly. That's quite true. A pain you wouldn't believe shocks you wouldn't believe, hell you wouldn't believe. At a certain point in this, not just one, not just two, but a whole series, which I, I won't explain, but a whole series of them to the point where something happened. I, I, my, my, I should go back. At the age of 18, the search started. A certain incident came that, that where the search started. Then it was a long, about 
many years after that, where the series of shocks came, where the hell was overpowering, intense, incredibly, horribly bad. But the con conscious, that much conscious aim that started at 18 persisted and leaped into the hell of a few years later so that the, the whispering was there that there, the hell need not be endured or b better yet, I'll explain it better, that question the hell, question it, right? Mm -hmm. I, it's there, man, it's there as a fact begin to question it then out out of that came my search to use the, the common term yeah. uh, Jim where where perhaps in our hell which we have all experienced to one degree or another rather than question it so much we have perhaps given ourselves self incrimination saying well <coughs> what am I doing wrong I'm not trying hard enough or I'm not I'm not putting forth the right effort or there's something wrong with me quote, rather than the hell. Yeah, what, what's the matter with me which keeps the me alive who's going to fight hell? The me and the hell are one. We love our hell. Oh yes, that's it. Because you love yourself or I love myself, right? I, I will tell you though, then we'll go on to Larry and then I think Margaret, you had your hand up. At a certain point, uh, the, the the closet door that we're in opens from the outside because you are no longer hanging on to it. You can't open the door, you understand. What you can do is let go of keeping it shut while you're inside. The minute you drop your grip on the dark closet door with you inside, when you drop your grip holding it, then the light outside pulls at it and pulls it out out and you'll see something that contrasts with the darkness of the closet you'll never be the same after that I tell you it's I, but you know there's a difference between what you saw and the darkness in the room there all right uh, Jim sorry but and then there is no way to explain on the intellectual level why uh, Vernon Howard, with all his suffering, was able to, you know, with the, no, not with somebody really. else who might have suffered equally much and fell by the wayside. Didn't use it, yes. Oh, yes. I'm not the only one who suffered. We've all yeah. suffered very badly, every one of us. Very true. But if you break out of that closet, then, say Jim, say Jim breaks out, you and I will both know what we're talking about using words, using the end, won't we? Because we know what's in back of the words, mm. the real experience. Then we, we can talk all we want, but we both understand. All right, now we'll get uh, one, two, three. Larry. I feel very much that uh, we have all seen this hell because we see that we're living in it even right. as of right now. <clears throat> and uh, I know for myself, and I think I can speak for others, you chose to understand it, to work real hard to understand the battle and the hell and the burning and the heat and the scars, where we still think that we can fight it and overcome it. Until such time as I get that me, fighter, scrapper, <clears throat> defender out of the way, understanding will not be, I will still be stirring up the hell within myself. <laughs> All right, that's a good comment. Sure. Were you through, really? Right. Yes. Uh, Margaret. Yes. Uh, I'm one of those people <coughs> who left here last night feeling very good. But there was a great deal of resistance coming here this morning. Oh. Uh -huh. And uh, when you said uh, that you probably could help us if we're blabbermouths by giving us a shock, you know. Uh, I'm aware that I'm a blabbermouth. Not all the time, but there are moments when I'm really a blabbermouth. But while I'm doing it, I'm also asking myself the question, why are you doing it? What is it you want from this person? It always feels like a tension, really. And when you talk to us as a group, um, I think I understand, but you don't shock me as much as when you say something to me personally. That's right. And uh, I guess that's okay, because 
one side of me is scared to have you tell me what you see, but the other side says, I want to hear. Mm -hmm. All right. Comment. Just as a comment, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, I was watching you, Margaret, while you were talking, and to Margaret and the rest of you, too, it's just a little thing, but we do 100 little things that makes a little bit of strength, right? So just one little thing. From now on, when you talk to me or anyone else, either in the class or anywhere else, you will no longer talk. The person is here, and you will no longer be looking at them. This is because you're in a, a state, a special kind of dreamland. You're thinking of what you're going to say next, right? We've all done this. You're looking at blah, blah, blah. You will break that habit, which is draining, and, and look at the person. Or look, doesn't mean you have to have staring herring, but you keep your eyes toward them instead of going like that. Um, last night you said in the lecture that the work would be done for us, and I noticed yesterday when I was jolted that um, it was very clear to me whether I wanted to enjoy my worry or uh, make a step towards spiritual progress and drop it, and uh, that was just very obvious to me. All right, then can you understand the decision is not just once, but a hundred times a day, as the choice comes up between us am I going to go into the intellect or am I going to drop the intellect and see the answer that is not the compulsive one we have to make those decisions all day and you'll make the right decision simply if you try to understand what it means to be awake which you understand after you've seen what it means to be asleep that's the order you have to see your sleep out of that you will see what it means to be awake never if you say I'm awake and my awakened state will study my darkness you're going into imagination that you're already awake which is where professional people make their mistake professional meaning preachers and psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, or the amateur philosopher on the street. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed how many of us are never without an answer for anything, no matter what's brought up? We've got a... Uh, we've got somebody. Who do we get? <laughs> uh, Murray, please. <coughs> relative to what you were saying and what Stella was saying after you make so many choices you personally after you made so many choices to go with truth did that precipitate the crack from outside that you were talking about meaning that truth would not give you more than what you could take and at some point you were ready you oh, opened up and let the crack happen? Yeah. It, it, write down a sentence. I must work diligently to induce my next disaster. I must work diligently to induce my next disaster. D I L I G E N T. You have to teach us spelling too. <laughs> we will go geography now. Less than that. My next disaster. Disaster. Look, it is your privilege to create tragedies in your life. Aren't you glad? Huh? <laughs> It should be the greatest, you, you know what I'm getting, I, we're smiling and that's fine all that. It should be the greatest pleasure of your life to get yourself in trouble 20 times a day. Some of you are saying without that I'm already getting into 30. <laughs> I get myself in trouble all the time. I love it, yeah. With me today, and I'm just shaking because I found out that I always try to keep myself very busy, and now I. I know. Now, do I just make myself? Yeah. Uh, let us repeat a familiar line. Nothing bad can happen to Linda, 
as a result of slowing down and having nothing to do. What you are having to do is driving you crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Look, look how the simple the logic is. What you're doing now is keeping you frantic. It's keeping you nervous. It's keeping you scared. And you always have to keep the next little distraction ahead of you. Notice when one begins to run out, the little nervous little mind starts to work for the, the next one. Party's over, so you're going to watch TV. TV's over, so you're going to go to bed in dream, go to dreamland. You get up in the morning, well, I'll turn the news or the radio on and keep that blatten during breakfast or something like that. Somebody coming in? Yes. Oh, okay. Keith, you're often late. Will you try to be here on time so it doesn't disturb the meeting? Quite often late. Try to get here. If it's impossible, then that's fine. We understand. But make an effort, if possible, to be here in time before the meeting. All right. Now listen to this and see if you can see if you can grasp it a little bit. First of all, will you agree that you don't know what to do with yourself? Yeah. Come on, you. Is, no, I'm not talking about going to the office. You're forced to do that. Will you agree you don't know what to do with yourself, mm -hmm. right. with your life? Okay. All right. Now, more good news, Margaret. Uh, careful with the word now, but I use it. God knows what to do with your life. Now, isn't no problems, no. Huh? No more problems, huh? You're going out of here free. Hmm? Truth knows what to do with your life. And you know what it, it does with your life? It lives it normally, naturally, unsickly. Now, don't ask what to do. Find out what not to do and see for yourself what replaces it. And what replaces it will be unimaginable. There's no way you can imagine it. If don't, I'm talking. Why do you raise your hand when I'm talking? Are you listening? Listen. Now, Mia, go ahead. Because I'm through now. Okay. Uh, I have found that I have had no choice as far as trying to program my day. Somehow the life has taken one on a me on a journey where all the props and everything is gone and I have found myself in my home all alone. And then I sort of went through what felt like a real death and whatnot. Then I tried to activate myself, but it didn't work anymore. I was thrown right back again to nothingness. And if I make an attempt, I get spaced out. And so I have to live in nothingness, but it feels okay now. You're a long ways from that, Margaret, and the rest of you too. And we better get something straight right now. Don't ever think you make choices. You and your choices are one. There is no you making a choice. You simply follow your conditioning, your habits, your compulsions. You and the habit are one thing. There's no you saying, now this morning I'm going to get up. There is just a getting up. And when you see this, you will begin to break down the, the idea that you can do anything with yourself. You are yourself. There's a certain oneness in you in a small way, which if you begin to see that, it'll help you just generally. Uh, yes, Jean. Our deep sleep is like a thick veil around us. It's just invisible, which is why we can't hear. How can you get through to us by gently poking the veil? You have to really slice through it. <coughs> yeah, we have to hit your feelings. And there are endless varieties in the way to do this. Some of you who have never been yelled at here, for example, I've been treating you in a way that will hurt your feelings. Now, what are you going to do with the fact that I very quietly hurt your feelings. Huh? You would prefer to be screamed at, wouldn't you? Now, there's a visible, there's a man there, at least I can see him and maybe yell back at him or something. But, but it's this subtle little lessons that bother us because you don't have anyone to attack or anyone to talk to or anyone to cry to. Who am I going to hit? There's nobody to hit. That's why I stay out of the way. <laughs>
<coughs> One, two. I want to get back to what you're talking about of creating your own hail. Here, I'm being taught a new way to think, which at some point I gather a little strength as I go, and I learn how to use the the situation that's there all the time that I have never used before, okay. and then I'm asking this as a question. Yes. Then I can go on and take on a bigger situation that I can never use before. Is that correct? Is well, that yes. I just said mm -hmm. that. You've only got uh, uh, small little fires of hell conscious in your mind. The idea of blabbermouthery or getting your feelings hurt in some way. We're trying to build an awareness of larger hells. Uh, I, I, you, you've got to suffer a thousand times more than you do, which simply means to see it, to use it. Yes, mm -hmm. we go from we're, we're not going from one light to another. It, it is that way, but we're going from one pain to a larger pain because we can only take very little small ones at the start. Uh, one, two, three. <clears throat> reference to what you said a minute ago <clears throat> I can see very clearly where over the years I have argued that you were too strong and that I have a good intellect and that if you just sat me down and explained things to me I would understand now I know that's a lie I know that's a lie and how do I know it is because nothing got through my thick head with all your talk after talk after talk polite talks yeah, it doesn't work does it pleasant. no sir it doesn't but I do know that when I go very deeply asleep and you quote rattle my timbers unquote that then there's a lesson in it for me so all I can see at this time is I've got to drop away the thinking mm. that I'm getting something accept the jolt be it and see it and maybe the, uh, uh, yes, not maybe, but and thereby learn something from these lessons. <clears throat> well said. Is the me that uh, thinks it's controlling its life uh, formed out of the pain, and then that's the part of me that's separate as a buffer against going back to the pain? Yes, the, the thought, the I, the pain, all that is one thing, and it's based primarily on the intellect, but it does spread to the emotions. Did we answer it or not? Yes. No. Right. Now, this self, when I'm self-observing myself during the day, say I'm noticing myself doing something that I know, well, this, no. Say I'm seeing myself doing something. Am I observing myself? No. Let's see. I, I see that I'm going to a movie. I see that I'm going to a movie in a panic, all right? And I see that if I went home, I'd be panic also. Is that self-observation? All right. When you're sitting in the movie and the um, cavalry is charging to rescue the fort from the Indians, when you're doing that, you're in thought. Therefore, you don't know that you're distracting yourself. It's you're one with the with the, what's going on on the screen there. What you should do and do it in front of your television set is suddenly and this would be a good habit, break yourself away from it and see yourself sitting and watching television. That's the best I can answer the question, which was not too clear to begin with. Shall we both try again? Uh, will this self-observation produce, will it change my actions during the day? Of course it will, because you'll be able to see wrong actions, compulsive actions. You'll be see where Rod is carried away by things that are bad for Rod. It's the seeing of them that is the same as the dropping of them. You'll never do anything against your real nature once you see what you have been doing against yourself. <coughs> Please remember that. I've, I've, you've had so much trouble with this. The careful close, honest seeing of self-destructive behavior, the seeing is the light that, but you, you, you think that just looking, is catching a pain is seeing it. Suffering it, suffering alone from it, is not seeing it. 
Just plain suffering is not seeing it. There has to be a part of you that's standing aside just for a minute. You drop your eyes away from the movie screen up there and you, and you suddenly become aware of how lonely you are. You went to that movie, you thought it would be good and exciting, it turned out to be duller than you thought. And then you, all right. And driving down to that movie, you pictured in your imagination, because you're lonely, you pictured a pretty girl standing out in front of the movie house, and she stands, she gets the ticket, uh, the booth there, out in front, just before you, and she's very pretty, and, j and just as she turns away, she drops her wallet, and you rush up, and you pick it up for her, and, and she smiles nicely, and she, you little sneaky coward, you won't even speak to a woman first. And so she says, I hope it's an interesting movie, and now you're terrified. This is your imagination going. Wait till the real thing happens. And, and so you picture yourself having a little more courage than you have in reality. So you say, here's your wallet. Well, I hope it is too. Are you going to the movie? <laughs> she just bought a ticket. You say, you're going to the movie? Uh, so you walk in together and you're both a little shy. But then your imagination goes and out you go. And afterward, it's dinner and the bedroom. Right? Huh? <laughs> How come you men are grinning so... <laughs> All this is very destructive behavior. Drop it. <coughs> Lorraine. Part of us says, lay it on us. We want the lessons. And then the other part says, but not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Jim. On that sentence you said, like, God knows what to do with my life. <laughs> But the problem comes in is that of my images of what this should be like. What this should... Oh, yes, of course. That's why you can't imagine heaven. If you imagine heaven, it'll be a very shaky hell. And you'll wonder where all the angels are. So you call the devil's angels. That's right. Any revival meeting or a hundred thousand people calling... Uh, angel, a uh, devil's angels, because they see them as angels because of the distortion in their own mind. We'll take a couple more, then have a break. Rod, please. Uh, if you see what you are doing, you will never do anything against your real nature. Correct. Mm -hmm. Truth can't harm itself. Would that isn't that a ridiculous thought that truth can harm itself? Untruth, masquerading as truth, can do endless harm, as we all know from living in this world, right? All right, let's do take a 10 minute break. And then Dorothy, you're on. And speakers, if they want. Last night, I was uh, deeply impressed by what uh, one person in this group said concerning that uh, he had problem with only one person in his life. And I am, <laughs> I've been in the same boat. I, I've been in the hell of revenge, and probably still I am, but through soul work I've been, I think that I've been able to survive and to deal with this uh, situation. This, I hit this guy twice, but I never was satisfied with that. I, I, after I hit him, that, 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 guy, that guy, he was passive. However, I never thought that I did a good job, and I wanted to hit him again and again. It's an endless uh, 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 mental agony, I would call that. But uh, thanks to the work, soul work, uh, by reading the book of Mr. Howard, I've been able uh, to control myself and to uh, react effectively. Uh, I mean, I've been doing the best, the best I can. Uh, still, I do not think that I am free of revenge desire, because still a revenge desire persists in me. But I believe that the way out is so work, and that's uh, because I have I, I have to work on myself and as well as in other area of life because I don't think 
there is any other way out except the cell work, cell observation, cell insight, cell control. If Mr. Howard had to say something about that, something that I might uh, keep in mind, uh, Uh, I would say that would be uh, helpful. At the same time, of course, a uh, evaluation of this teaching is the most important thing. Then the application of this teaching, that's the hardest. Mm. That's the hardest, the application yes. of this teaching. Because sometimes, we know, I believe, I've been reading the book of Mr. Howard for about 10 years. I have all his books. I, I, I believe I have about 65 pages. And I learn. I, I, I read uh, his book every day. I listen to the tape every day. However, when a situation arises suddenly, my goodness, how hard is to apply, you know, yes. what we know into a certain situation. That's the problem. And then, and then when we fail, when we fail, we, uh, uh, we are regretful. You know, my goodness, why I did that? Why didn't I apply so many principles? I have a book of principles from the uh, highlight, from the book I've been, I've been taking highlight. I have a different system for work. A, a card, I have a, a certain card uh, with principle, and I would say, well, I am going, in this situation, I am going to apply this principle. But when the situation arises, I can, well, sometimes I can. But most of the time, I can apply, you know, that principle to that situation. However, the principle is workable. But the problem is not the principle. The problem is in me, which I fail to apply the principle at the right time. And after that, I feel guilty. Guilty of what? Guilty of not being able to apply what I have learned. Therefore, that's my great battle, you know, since I wake in the morning until I go to bed at night, you know, I try to keep myself, uh, my attention, you know, uh, friendly, and when daydreaming appear, I try to <coughs> stop them. Well, I have certain methods for work on that in order to be able to be awake, because most of the time I have realized it, that when I try to apply a principle, it's because I've been daydreaming, and therefore, when I, I am more conscious of myself, more conscious of other people, I am able to apply the work more effectively in every situation. And that doesn't mean that I do that all the time, because in fact, I am not conscious all the time. You know, I am striving, you know, against uh, the unconscious forces, you know, of our memory, which at the same time create negative imagination, which I believe is that what makes us afraid. Therefore, in a striving for to be more and more conscious of me and of other people, I have found that I am able also to apply more effect effectively what I have learned over here. Bring it to a conclusion. Yes. Conclusion, does this, the, that uh, what Mr. Benohar will teach <coughs> work, and that we have to make more effort in order to apply what we have learned. That's my conclusion. Oh, excuse me. Here it comes. I fully agree that Mr. Howard has become most unsociable and very unpleasant to his nice little students. <laughs> We all come here and we, like little puppies, waggle around Mr. Howard and hoping that he smile kindly on us and listens to our nonsense and try to catch his eye and take his time when he wants to relax, as John always points out. But we just think it doesn't apply to us, we have the right. And you made a very good statement. <coughs> among other good ones. Are you talking to me or to the yes, audience? to you. Oh, to the audience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that we are stealing from you, which I examined in myself, and indeed I found 
that my main motive directed to your attention was that I wanted something. But when I was examining to see what I wanted, I couldn't really say what I wanted in simple words. And I felt that it was one of my most valuable lessons <coughs> that you pointed out that we are thieves in the night trying to steal from you. You're not able to come on Sunday, Margaret? No, I cannot. Fine, you're on now. early age, I was programmed by my father to be an overachiever, and I have received all of the awards that a father will give you in society, but it all collapsed some years ago. But I still have remnants of the problem, particularly in relationship to men, and needing to please, but I'm getting better, but my history has been, if it doesn't work, I exit. For the last seven years I stayed in a relationship with a man. But the game is still going on, but I think I'm doing better since I've come here. Um, I'm aware of a lot more, and I seem to have a little more strength to deal with little things. Like, for instance, last night when I came home from here, I felt real good. And he was out, and he came home from his whatever it was. And I got caught up with a TV program, and I sort of enjoy the characters as well. Uh, you talked about we can get something by observing the characters. But he always falls asleep on me when he joins me, whether it's 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, or 11 o'clock. And I don't particularly like that. For a long time, you know, I did a head game, well, detach yourself, all that kind of stuff. So last night I said, look, if you're sleepy, don't sit here. Why don't you go to bed? And uh, he got angry, but I didn't react and he went to bed. This is small, but I noticed this morning he was pouting, and maybe that's why I got caught in his thing and the energy <laughs> didn't drive me here, but I let go. Another thing, a little thing, we have two TVs, and he's director of a center in Las Vegas, and their TV broke down. So he wanted to take the smaller TV for two days. It's two weeks now, and the TV still is there. And I said to him this morning, I want that TV back. It might be selfish, I don't care if you were going to get one in two days, so he's got to get a TV. And it's because I'm coming here that I seem to be getting stronger in order to deal with these things. Thank you. Fine. Yes. I'm going to talk about observation. So I'm sitting there watching the, they come up here and talk. I was wondering to myself, are they aware of what they're saying? Why are they telling every one of you what their problem is? What do you have to care? Everybody has their own problems. And then they feel hostile because they're just pouring out to you, just trying to lay it on someone else. I felt myself pulling for him, trying to... make them not feel embarrassed like I was right in my seat. Is there anyone else who wants... Yes, you can invite questions if you want, you know. <coughs> 